Hey everybody, we are looking for medical students to join our Curbsiders team with an application deadline of Friday, April 10th, 2020. Let's hear from Hannah and Beth for more details. Hi, I'm Hannah R. Abrams. I'm an MS4 who runs the Curbsiders Twitter account. And I'm Beth Garbs Garbatelli, a rising MS3 who runs the Instagram account for the Curbsiders. So being a part of the Curbsiders team for both of us has just been this incredible opportunity to learn from the community and the conversation that happens around each episode. Yeah, I've really found that each episode is sort of a chance to deep dive into a clinical topic. So on top of how much fun you have working with the team, a lot of fun. I also get a chance to learn and to learn a lot too. Um, and that's why we're putting out this call for applications to join the team. Um, we're really interested in bringing on pre-medical or medical students who are looking to expand their clinical and podcasting skill set, or in curbsider speak, students who are looking for a little podcasting knowledge food for their brain hole. Yummy. <laughs> <laughs> We'd really be interested in hearing from folks who have a specific interest in video editing, website development, or Instagram. So if you're interested in joining, send a CV and a half page about who you are, why you're a good fit for our team to thecurbsiders at gmail.com. Feel free to include any social media handles, and we can't wait to see what you come up with. The Curbsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly Cash Like More Hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Paul... It's must, must must be our fifth show in five days, <laughs> and I don't think that is hyperbole. No, we're doing great. We're doing great. Yeah, but you know, I felt so. This the topic tonight is how to create an online curriculum. I feel like we really need this now in medical education. Uh, once again, this is the Curbsiders and Paul. Before you tell them about our wonderful guests, do you want to tell them what we what we do on this show? Happy to. As always, we are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We bring you expert interviews to bring you clinical roles and practice changing knowledge. Um, this is a little bit of a different topic. Rather than sort of going something that is more clinical, we're actually talking about how to put together an online curriculum with uh, two amazing guests. We have uh, Dr. Amrit Sidhu and Dr. Kat Zekar. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about each of them individually now. So Amrit Sidhu is a Toronto-born undercover nerd. Um, maybe not so undercover. I don't think you resent me saying that. He's currently disguised as an internal medicine chief resident at a community program in the Detroit area. He has a keen interest in evidence-based learning and is motivated to build upon his medical education work as bros and cephalon. Outside of medicine, he spends time exploring the arts, the gym, or various dance floors. He says, hi, mom. Um, hopefully she's listening. Dr. Zecker is a physician, a mother, and a resident educator working as an associate program director at St. Joseph Mercy Oakland in Pontiac, Michigan. Her special interests include effective, goal-driven resident mentorship, objective learner assessments, and clinical reasoning skills. And her personal wellness plan is reading with her kids, aerial acrobatics, which we discuss a little bit, and single malt scotch, which we don't. Her daily struggles are to take her own wellness advice and the elusive search for the perfect pen, which I think anyone will tell you is the Pilot G2, um, but we didn't get to talk about it, so... <laughs> Without much further ado, we will now tell you how to create your own uh, personal online curriculum. Kat and Amrit, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Kat, I want to start with you. And if you could give us a one-liner about yourself, tell us something that you do outside the world of medicine as well. Uh, well, I uh, so my one-liner is I'm a 36-year-old community uh, associate program director. Uh, I am a doctor mom who... I love to mentor my residents, and I also like to hang upside down off circus equipment. Yes, your your image, your thumbnail image here has you, it looks like you're hanging off of some sort of equipment. I was wondering what that was. So that's called a lira. It's basically a vertical metal hula hoop that you can do all sorts of fun tricks on. I think Paul is, Williams is quite accomplished in that same art form. Yeah, no, it's 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 you wouldn't know it to look at me, but I'm super flexible. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> is this something like when when did this interest develop? Is this something you've done your entire life, or is this a relatively recent development? When did you when and how did you pick this up? Um, so the short answer is, is I broke my leg playing roller derby, and I needed something else crazy to do. Um, so I found this in the D Metro Detroit area. There are actually two different circus schools here who are both fantastic and just a great community of people so so just to get this straight you broke your leg and then you were like 
I want to hang off of like, you know, I want to join the circus because that seems safe and hang off <laughs> rings suspended in the air. Yes, it All was right. relatively safe. Paul, we've had a lot of badasses on the show lately. Have you noticed that? It's, I mean, I, I think I made the point before, just every guest has better hobbies than I do. And that's, <laughs> I've just come to reconcile myself with that. It's okay. Amrit, uh, one liner and maybe a hobby. It doesn't have to be as cool as cats, though. That's, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be tough to follow that up. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm a 30 year old nerd, I guess, who's into everything from medicine to various arts to sports and, and fitness and video games. And I'm usually spending the majority of my time exploring or diving into one of those things with some some type of headphones on. All right. Kat, we, can you give us a, a recommendation, some sort of book that you've recently enjoyed? And, and if it's not a book, then maybe just some escapist thing that you're doing during this this horrible pandemic that's going on right now? Uh, the book I really want to recommend right now is Nick Offerman's Gumption. So this is the guy that plays Ron Swanson on Parks and Rec, but he walks through American history telling about you know 20 different characters that all had gumption, which is, in his words, the will to do good work worth doing. And it's fantastic. It's just lighthearted. His audio read of it is fantastic. And I really enjoyed it start to finish. That sounds wonderful. Amrit, um, how about you? you know, I also have a, a book um, you know, I would tout, especially in, in current times. Uh, it's a book called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Uh, I guess it's relatively popular, but it's something that I only found out about recently. And I learned a lot from it. It's a, it's a very nice exploration of human psychology, and especially in regards to how we as humans experience suffering and, and how surrounding all of that, we all have to find meaning in our lives in some way or another. Um, so certainly relevant to our careers as, a, as physicians, and it's, it's something that's unlocked, you know, my ability to facilitate it, not just in myself, but for the people around me. So I, I would definitely recommend giving that a look. Paul Williams, did you want to give a pick of the week? Yeah, I not anymore. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's hard to follow up man's search for meaning. Um, yeah, I was thinking about it, and I... So I'm reading mentioned video games, and that prompted me to think of actually a game that I, I I've just been enjoying very much recently that feels kind of related to the current environment. So I don't know. Have you heard of Death Stranding? No. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's and I'm gonna mispronounce the name. I apologize, but Hideo Kojami, he um, it's this game. I can't even describe the plot because it is just cuckoo bonkers. It, it's set in the post-apocalyptic United States. Um, basically, there's a large event that decimated a lot of the population. The main character is played by Norman Reedus of The Walking Dead. Um, and you just basically carry stuff around and learn how to walk for like the first 10 hours of the game. And then meanwhile, <laughs> the plot is just insane. But the more I play it, the more I realize it's actually a game about how technology actually both isolates and connects us. And then it's also about sort of man's relationship with death and mortality. And so it's a really beautiful game. There's actually a lot of deep philosophical underpinnings. And then also it's just bizarre and stupid at the same time. So like it's a game that makes me think, but is also simultaneously ridiculous. So if you have... If you're stuck inside, you have, you know, two straight days to kill. You could probably get halfway through that game. And it's just a lot of walking around and trying not to fall down. And yet it is still uh, almost a spiritual game and, and one that I find kind of profound. So I would recommend Death Stranding if you're into that kind of thing. Yeah, it's a great one. The game also just looks beautiful, too. Yeah, 100%. I'll, I'll give a quick pick of the week. This is a movie that I watched just because it was on HBO and I recently signed up for HBO for obvious reasons. And uh, it was Alita Battle Angel, which it wasn't, it was fun. It had some cool, <laughs> cool action. And uh, it's like James Cameron, I think, started the movie and then was like, ah, I don't have time for this. And then he gave it to Robert Rodriguez. I believe that's the story. And maybe there will be a sequel, but I think it's a pretty cool movie. Like it's a, it's a fun watch. That's I, I can't do a Paul Williams style review. A lot, a lot of great pull quotes there. Yes. <laughs> Pretty cool movie, Raves Matt Watto. Some okay action. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually really enjoyed it. I thought it was it was just what I was looking for. So I've heard good things actually. Yeah. It's it I think it it got uh I think it got beat up a little bit by critics, but I don't think it fully warranted that. Um, well, Paul, why don't you start us off with a, a case from Cashlack so we can really dive into the topic here, because I know this is going to be really important to our listeners, many of whom are trying to do what Kat and Amrit have done. Yeah, so I'm gonna. this is the punniest name I was able to come up with, so apologies in advance, but this is, I mean, we're going to talk about Dr. Homer Coughlin. He's an associate program director for the Internal Medicine Residency Program for Cashlack North Central. Um, 
he's been hearing more and more about this idea of asynchronous learning and online education, and it's starting to make sense because as the hospital gets busier, morning uh, report attendance kind of starts to wane. The new conference, people aren't showing up to it. They're either busy with work or just trying to get lunch in, and it seems to be a, a, just a, a decrement of interest. And so they, you can't even lure people in with mediocre pizza anymore. So he's starting to think about doing more of an online curriculum has heard about this amazing online curriculum at St. Joseph Mercy, Oakland, in Pontiac, Michigan, and reaches out to you two to ask for your help. And so before we even get to sort of what you did and how, how Dr. Coughlin can replicate it, I'm, you, you two, I, and I guess with a third, have developed a successful online curriculum. So I'm just wondering, before we start, what prompted you to even take on this project? And let's start with a uh, cat first. All right. So uh, our program went through a big period of change. We um, pretty much swapped out our associate and uh, program directors all within a period of about two years. And so when our new program director, Dr. Geisha, uh, Geetha Krishnamurthy, or GK, uh, she came into our program ready packaged with 15 years of board his, uh, review history. And um, she had notes, she had quizzes and lecture videos all housed on this website. And so once uh, Amrit started his chief year with me as associate program director, it was a good opportunity to restructure the program as a whole. So I'll let Emery take over what kind of our goals were. Um, right. Um, you know, so just stemming from what Kat was just explaining, the transition that our program was in just naturally prompted us to take a look at our curriculum and at the same time assess what our learners were interested in, what they felt uh, deficiencies were in the, in the curriculum. And with Dr. Krishnamurthy coming in with her personal website that had already just been a host for her own content, the idea of coming up with an online supplement to what we were restructuring um, as the in-person curriculum um, was just a, a, a natural idea that came about. Some of the, the major things we wanted the website to help us fix um, were three major things, I suppose. Uh, one thing was resident engagement, uh, one thing that um, our situation at Cash Like Hospital also seems to be dealing with is dwindling didactic attendance for morning reports or, or various uh, types of lectures. So we saw very easily how our online platform or this online supplement could offer opportunities for attendance outside of what was blocks of time in the middle of the clinical workday, uh, which in itself as a resident is unpredictable and very dependent on patient volume and what's going on on the floors on that time. So we felt that we could extend uh, another hand to our learners in terms of opportunities to attend lectures and interact with educational material. We also were very excited by the idea of the fact that we could just build different types of tools. The uh, an online medium offers so many different opportunities to bring in technology, to bring in other sources of material, and to bring in other learning environments, in addition to what, I guess, traditional uh, pedagogy already offers in person. So bringing all that together, we figured not only should we build something like this, but why not measure and examine how it could work and how efficacious it could be over the course of a year long's curriculum and eventually it became a, a research project that we are still sort of building and, and uh, examining right now. It's funny that your uh, example at Cashlack brings up the fact that they were offering mediocre pizza to try and get residents to all these engagements. During our course of setting up our research, we were looking at what drives resident engagement. And I came across a great article called Number Needed to Eat. Mm -hmm. where they studied exactly what impact food made, and they determined it cost $46 per additional resident in a seat um, in terms of food to improved <laughs> attendance ratio. Wow. That's a lot of pizza. Right, right, and especially if you buy the pizza that we buy at Cashlack, that's, I mean, $46 will buy you, I think, 45 pizzas, is that right? I mean, they're not good. <laughs> Or a hundred stale bagels, uh, <laughs> sure, <laughs> which also seem to be a popular staple. Well, so so it sounds like you did have some uh, with with GK coming in with a website. It sounds like you did have some. I because I I'm just thinking that, and I know we're going to talk specifics. I'm just thinking that listeners are gonna start hearing this and say, oh well, they had someone that already had a website. So how am I going to possibly do this? So hopefully you know, we will help them answer that question and start to point people in the right direction with this. So I wanted to ask, you know, you mentioned 
So actually, it's funny you mentioned lecturing to an empty classroom. So I, I just recently had the opportunity to give a lecture on the musculoskeletal examination and, and the primary care approach to that right as they were disbanding in-person classes because of the current um, pandemic. And so I literally gave a lecture to a huge lecture hall with two learners in it, um, <laughs> which was bizarre. So I guess where the point I'm making is one of the reasons I think we were excited to talk about this is that there is now a, a huge impetus to not have people in the same room together and how do we deliver educational content in a different way than traditional lecture room format. I guess my question for you guys is before all this happened, did you envision this as a supplement to existing lectures and um, didactics, or is this to replace it? Like, what was your original vision for putting this out? Our, our vision was to build it as as a supplement, as a kind of a, a support system, um, because not only were we, we were noticing we had, I guess, dwindling or inadequate attendance or whatever we deemed as inadequate, but the the people themselves who were showing up for for lecture was changing day to day, and after surveying the residents and, and seeing uh, what their daily workflows was like, a lot of this just came down to, oh, this these two floor teams were just a little bit more busier in the morning and they weren't able to make it to conference on time. So we figured um, by creating something sustainable and accessible online, we could accommodate for those variations in day-to-day -day workflow and how busy residents are. And kind of as a, as a side effect, we saw inpatient attendance not really change much in terms of the numbers, but we saw more sustained access from the learners uh, if we looked at the individuals and across PGY years. All right. Well, it sounds like you guys were intensely thoughtful and you had sort of a good base, but I, I would lo love to hear actually what specifically you put together. So what, what did you arrange and what offerings did you actually have for your residency program? What did this look like? To put it plainly, we, we, we made a website. Um, <laughs> Great. Well, all that's right. all the time we have. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, 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 that's the end. Um, we, we, we made a website, and like we were discussing uh, just now, our main goal was to supplement our core internal medicine curriculum being offered uh, in the in-person setting. So I suppose we decided on three major um, segregations or sections of the supplemental curriculum. Uh, the first one, or the major one, being just core internal medicine educational material. And uh, we can unpack this a little bit more as to what we use as a skeleton to structure the, the actual type of content and, and subject matter that we were putting onto the website in these sections. We also wanted to offer our learners different modalities of, of learning and testing their knowledge. Uh, so we decided on two different self-assessment tools that we built out using pretty accessible and easy to learn tools in terms of how to build them. And then similarly, we also build interactive stuff um, covering clinical scenarios in, in terms of rapid response calls or a stroke code, for example, or a, a difficult diagnostic situation. We uh, divided uh, each of our teaching and learning modalities into those three sections. In terms of the website itself, we created a password protected website, uh, which allowed us a lot of benefits, especially in terms of monitoring and controlling the curriculum. This allowed us to give depersonalized login information for each of our residents, which then allowed us on the back end to make score reporting and self-assessment feedback a lot easier and, and self-directed, uh, as well as uh, open up a lot of doors in terms of collecting data, monitoring web traffic, um, and things of that nature. What Amrit's saying is, sorry, um, we uh, we would provide a specific code word to each PGY level. So PGY ones were flowers, PGY twos were superheroes, which was an interesting side effect because people would be talking about like how Batman really smoked the Hemont quiz this month. Uh, <laughs> That's great. But it, it also let learners kind of on a month per month basis see where they were uh, standing amongst the residency instead of just all the in-training exams come out, uh, everybody hoards their score and doesn't talk about it, um, which was one of those unintended benefits that Amrit's mentioning. So you're saying that there was like a scoreboard and it would say like Batman versus like Chrysanthemum or something like that. And they that you could see how, how, much, Precisely. how much people were doing and people would have the choice whether or not they would say they would tell people who they were. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And then you guys had the key, so you could you could then track how much time they spent, which quizzes they did, what their, what their score was, and that sort of thing. For sure. And um, Kat's probably better to speak to add on to that. But I also think it helped faculty just kind of track track learners and and make sure everybody was progressing as well too. So you gave the you gave your core faculty access to this as well. 
Well, part of my role as associate program director is I'm head of CCC, our um, milestones committee. Um, and so, as y'all well know, it's it's so hard to to get learner feedback once or twice a year. And so when we could come up on a quarterly or a semi-annual basis and be able to look at six months worth of data instead of just one exam or one evaluation form, it was tremendously helpful if we had learners that were falling behind on medical knowledge um, and we had encouraged them to do more work or if we had folks that were exceptionally strong and all of a sudden they just fell off on their quizzes, we could say, what's going on here? What do we need to fix? Um, so the other, another unintended benefit for this website was that it gave our assessment committee just a wealth of knowledge um, in terms of participation and learner proactivity when it came to building their knowledge. That's exciting because I feel like there's so much stuff that you could track. So did you see or have you looked at, has there been a change in in-training exams overall? Do you notice that the scores on these quizzes track within training exams? Have you seen an effect on your board rate? I feel like I have about a bazillion questions to ask now. We will at S Gym twenty twenty one. I got it. So you don't have the you, you don't have the f the full data yet, but you're th this, these are the kind of questions you will be able to answer. That's, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what we're measuring. Yeah. So I I want this to be like very uh, practical for the audience, and so so right now it sounds like you've you've built a website that has it has some videos, it has pages with text. You're linking out to other things. You made multiple choices, questions. You you said there's flashcards, and then there's some interactive cases. That all sounds like something that I don't have the know-how to build. Uh, maybe some of it because I I I do work with a website, but I, I'm saying if I'm the list, if you're I'm your average listener, I'm saying I probably don't have any experience doing any of this. So Amrit, uh, where would where would you suggest people start? Uh, let's just just stick with the website first. What kind of website should they get? Should they buy one of these Squarespace or Wix, one of these out of the box things? Or do you think a WordPress site is is a better place for people to go if they don't maybe have your technical capabilities? Gotcha. So actually, you know, before even unpacking that nitty gritty, um, which I have in store for all of you, uh, I think one thing uh, Kat and I both wanted to express was uh, taking a step back even from the idea of just making an online tool like this and first building a team uh, together that will be able to, number one, identify and address the curricular gaps or, or the learner needs that you need specifically at your program. And then, of course, the technical ability to kind of uh, put all this together and deploy this. So we were very, very blessed to have Dr. GK, who herself is just a walking encyclopedia. And so we were never in any lack of medical content and somebody willing to deliver that content to residents at an appropriate level, and especially with it catering towards the ABIM certifying exam. Because I really do think that the technical part of this is rather the simpler part. Um, for us, the bigger challenge, the bigger barrier was figuring out what to design. And the other prong of that, which um, Kat, as our associate program director, really uh, filled for us was assessing what the learners were interested in, getting a sense from them what they felt they lacked and how they perceived the educational resources that were available to them, both on the market and both that the program was already offering or pushing their way. Um, so that really... That was what focused our attention to building something interactive and making sure that there were self-assessment tools that were accessible and affordable, essentially, well, for our residents, they were free, um, but something that they could tap into right as an intern, as opposed to waiting a few years, having to get something off the market like UWorld or MixApp, uh, things that young residents may not necessarily be able to tap into right away. So we'll start from the top uh, with uh, what... Um, Dr. Wado was saying, we use WordPress. Um, I think you'd be able to achieve any successful online platform using any of the available sites out there. But we found that WordPress was not only the easiest to use, but had a lot of free, easy to understand nuts and bolts that we could also throw on the website uh, to build some of these other tools out. So we ended up using WordPress and we paid a little bit extra to be able to host media and, and to have a little bit of storage space online. Um, and alongside of that, we obtained a domain, which is are usually very affordable nowadays. I think we pay about $7 a year um, for a URL that all of our residents can access the website at. And we 
ultimately later in the academic year decided to use Zoom when we needed to kind of scale our didactics to accommodate for the pandemic. But the backbone of this is a WordPress account with an associated domain name. And I think together it costs us about $300 a year for for the hosting and the domain. And we should talk about the the hosting thing. So, and I'll, I'll give my simp- simplistic version of, of what this is. A So a simple Word, WordPress blog is free, right? And you don't, I think, or it's free or very cheap, but you're talking about if you're going to be uploading media to that there, then you need to pay for like extra server space to make sure that your site doesn't run super slow when people are trying to access like a video that's hosted on your website versus if your video was like hosted on YouTube or something like that, it, it doesn't really tax your website's resources for someone to to, to run a YouTube video. But if you're hosting the, the content, videos, audio files, and things like that on your website, you need to pay for a little bit of extra server space or power. Is that correct? Exactly. That's exactly right. Now, we did use Vimeo um, specifically because the playback options on it are so well suited to what the learners want. Um, If they've got a 90-minute to two-hour board review, um, they will tend to watch it on a slightly accelerated speed to make the most out of their time. Um, So that was where Vimeo came in, and it it was worth the additional expense, about another $240 a year. Um, It let us set very careful privacy levels. Uh, We have a sister institution that we share some of our content with. So we got to keep some of it outside the website. We got to keep some of it inside the website. And that'll be a recurring theme of what media was kept at what level of security. And so there was a lot of thought that went into that. Uh, Kat, can you tell us why specifically you felt you needed to password protect the videos? I'm not I'm not following that part. Uh, So. Part of it was is that um, not every member who was being videotaped either for Grand Rounds or a noon conference felt comfortable having it out to the wider audience. Um, we were still dealing with some semi-proprietary board review material. Uh, anytime we covered anything patient uh, information related, especially when we were doing our um, mortality and morbidity conferences, we wanted sure. to keep those locked down. Perfect. Okay. That makes sense. Amrit, I'm sorry. I think I might have cut you off. Did you have a follow up about the video stuff that we're we're talking about? Uh, no, I just to stem to Kat's answer there. It also helped protect our data, um, such that you know links were not really trickling too far out of the program space, in the sense of protecting our our research project and making sure our data was as accurate as possible. That that also helped as well too. Okay, so so far we have. Uh, a wordpress.com website with media hosting we have vimeo we pay a little bit for there you said around 240 a year the wordpress you said was 300 a year or so and then you're also what other software are you are you using and then we can get into some of the actual equipment uh, down the line sure uh so the software again um i guess to frame it generally for everybody listening is really going to stem from what you were trying to build. So for example, we we reference how we we bring in Vimeo and use it for uh, lecture hosting on um, on I guess as a third party site from our website. We then use a a free WordPress plugin called uh, Video Lesson Manager that essentially brings those Vimeo links and, and embedded videos back into our website and allows us to not only organize it, say, by organ system. So, for example, we have, you know, four pulmonology lectures as part of our ABIM board review. It allows us to bring that back and present them onto the website as a pulmonology course. And in tying into the user logins that every resident has, this plugin lets us track attendance and track how many viewing hours the residents are accumulating over the years. So I don't think uh, GME programs out there are going to be shy to any of this type of data. I think a lot of this could be used to help curricular design and to help strengthen curriculum out there. So this is why we would definitely recommend considering WordPress as an outlet for this, because a lot of these plugins just naturally tie into the idea of an online curriculum, but also give us the ability to, to measure all of this stuff. Do you, do you have any idea what a, a GK's husband helped you guys on the back end of this? And Amrit, it sounds like you also were able to do some of this yourself, but do you have any idea what this would cost to get somebody to build you a WordPress website and kind of maintain it? Is it, I think it's on the order of like 1500 a year or so, but I'm not, 
I'm not exactly sure. Uh, do you, do you have any idea? I'm not too familiar with that. Um, I, I do know of the services that you're referencing. Um, but again, I, I think this is something that a lot of GME programs could really could pick up on their own. It, it may take some time to play with the tools, but WordPress in itself is is very intuitive in terms of its visual interface and, and guiding people through creating a website. And along with that comes all of these plugins. There's certainly a lot of technical kinks that I think people are going to see themselves standing in front of. But I, I think that the time investment of this is certainly going to outweigh paying a service like that. Okay. Yeah. And then the, the other software you mentioned that you use is the Zoom meeting software. And how much does that cost? And d- d- there's a free version, but do you re- you recommended the paid version. What does it, What extra does that get you? And do you recommend that? Absolutely. Zoom was the uh, the first thing that we bought when we realized that we were limited to uh, 10 people to a room. Um, and so that helped streamline our flow. And we're going to keep this. This was something that we hadn't originally planned as part of our website. But the ease of recording, um, being able to download it from a cloud-hosted service, um, to be able to bring in multiple people. So if somebody was off campus and wanted to remote in for a lecture, uh, our learners have really responded to this favorably because they can use their mobile device uh, wherever they are to get in and see a lecture for whatever time they've got. Um, but it really has streamlined. So as unpleasant as the situation we're in right now is, it was kind of the impetus for some much needed polishing and change for our website. We uh, we needed about 100 participants for our 50-person residency to account for our students as well. And that was worth the uh, 180 a year. Yeah. And we, we use Zoom for the podcast. It has a button that you can just click record and you can record it locally on your computer. If you want to record it into their cloud, they don't give you much space. You have to pay an upgrade, which I th- it's I think it's $40 a month or something like that to get like 100 gigabytes storage in the cloud. But it'll record video and audio tracks so you can do... Uh, you can you can use it pretty easily to record yourself, and uh, it is it is very intuitive to use. It's it's kind of like Skype if people have not not heard of it. I feel like now in in pandemic world, everyone has heard of this company. <laughs> it's probably like the the stock is probably soaring right now amidst everything else that is not. Um, yeah, no, Zoom, Zoom is uh, is you know exactly how you're saying in, in this pandemic proven to to fill that gap, but just as a a tool for a website like this, I would also consider or rather suggest to GME programs that they consider using Zoom because um, you refer to exactly where it could play in. It intuitively records uh, what's either on the screen or the audio that is being recorded by a laptop, let's say that's in front of a presenter for a lecture, and on can automatically seamlessly upload to Vimeo. Um, so actually when we scale this out for the pandemic, it Zoom naturally fit into our website and actually made my personal workflow and my workday a lot less stressful. So that's great. the The next stuff that I want to talk about is a little bit of the equipment. You mentioned that you're doing video. What equipment would you recommend that people buy? Do they need to spend like 500 bucks on a GoPro, or is are you guys <laughs> just using cell phones? Uh, so we we definitely using a traditional uh, digital high definition camera, but nothing very fancy uh, in any means. Um, a very uh, entry-level $75 camera with a tripod that we use for positioning and, and of course, uh, make sure the camera works properly, and two SD cards. So in total for the camera, tripod, and SD cards, it costs about, about $120. But this is where GME programs certainly have that flexibility. You know, If they do have the technical capacity, something like Zoom could replace the need for this camera in entirety, uh, whereas uh, the camera also offers flexibility in in terms of where you're having a lecture. Sometimes we had morning reports in the residence lounge. Sometimes we had our morning reports in an actual lecture room with a podium and a digital screen. Um, so there's there's certainly pros and cons both ways for people looking to replicate something like this. Right. And with Zoom, you're saying Zoom could replace it because you're just using the front facing camera on the computer to capture the lecturer. Uh, that or, you know, it, it you can use uh, Zoom's recording ability to capture the slides that oh, the, the presenter slides. will be having on the laptop, you know, or the device that they're presenting off of. And Zoom software will, of course, record the audio as the 
lecturer speaks. Right. Um, so that could just be opened up on, you know, if you're in a lecture hall that has a laptop in front of you or a large auditorium with a, a, a present, uh, you know, a computer at the podium, whatnot, that could be a potential tool um, for anybody wanting to use video lectures okay. as part of their online tool. One of the things we found with our speakers is it was fairly universal on our end that nobody wanted to be on the video. Um, so as soon as you reassured everybody that, no, no, the camera is pointed at your slides, you're not going to be on it, everybody cooled off. So we're finding that um, our learners didn't necessarily need to see the speaker, and our speakers didn't necessarily want to be on camera, which is why Zoom ended up being a fairly easy screen share with audio over it um, substitute. Yeah. So if someone was using that high definition digital camera, then is there you also have a microphone that goes along with that? And can you talk about how that connects and if there's a specific microphone you recommend? So we actually ended up just scaling back and using the built-in microphone that the camera had. Okay. But we decided to arm ourselves with one just in the case that we were in a lecture setting. Um, like we, um, this might also be specific to other program situations, but at our hospital, um, we either had a way too many rooms to choose from for our lectures or not enough. So we erred on the side of caution and wanted to make sure that we had a microphone and recording equipment available to cater our needs. Um, other programs out there might be in, in a more directed seamless. They might have a dedicated room, for example, for their program that they may be able to approach things with a little bit more clarity. Okay. Are there any other tools or equipment that we're forgetting to talk about? I think in terms of equipment, that's that's about it. Um, am I forgetting anything, Dr. Secker? Uh, cat. Um, <laughs> the uh, ABI Blueprint. Um, really, that was kind of the backbone. We kept coming back to that over and over again to say, these are the topics that we need to make sure we cover over the year. Um, we, you know, we fall prey to any program is that nobody wants to cover um, geriatrics falls, but we've had our fourth AFib lecture for the year. <laughs> the The blueprint is this, these are just the learning, these are the learning objectives that the ABM puts out for for internal medicine trainees? Right. Uh, s similar to that. I, I can unpack that a little bit. So it's, first of all, it's fairly accessible. Uh, I think if you just type in ABIM certifying exam blueprint, it might be the first or second hit. And what it is, is essentially just a breakdown of topics on the uh, board exam, the ABIM board exam, and they stratify it in terms of topic and then subtopic under each organ system. Um, so it not only serves as a checklist, but we uh, we viewed the blueprint as something that allowed us to stratify the material that we were putting out there. For example, that blueprint has 14% of the board exam being cardiovascular disease whereas less than 1% of the exam is allergy, if I'm remembering correctly off the top of my head. So that allowed us to address those gaps in the curriculum a lot more direct, in a, a lot more directed manner. You know, we knew that we did maybe have to have one dedicated lecture on AFib and then a second dedicated lecture on stable angina, for example. Uh, and maybe we didn't need three lectures on anaphylaxis. Um, again, these are just hypothetical examples out there. And then on the part of the learners, we really made the blueprint something accessible and framed it to them in a way where, you know, this this is a tool that you can use in your preparation, your individual preparation for the board exam itself. So the feedback we've gotten from learners is that they've been able to use this stratification of material to better identify what their gaps in knowledge are. And that really ties into the self-assessment tools and everything else that we have available. Um, so I kind of now I'm alluding to some of our major points about all this is that how this this online and tool uh, has really over time allowed us to change the entire academic in, environment. Uh, you know, now at our at our program, it's not just something. It's not just a curriculum centered uh, around sitting in a in a room and, and listening to a lecture. I think learners now have gotten into the habit of accessing this website all the time, waiting for updates, and using everything that was available through it. And I think both from the educator side of things and learner side of things, things are really coalesced in the middle and we're starting to see um, a lot of benefits. So could I, would you mind telling me, because the part, the part that I think is the most exciting is probably the interactive components of what you put together. Because I think, you know, 
getting a website hosted and putting up some video content is probably some junior varsity stuff. I say that not that I could do it, um, <laughs> but I feel like the, the more varsity level stuff that would be sort of the barrier, but is also the most interesting stuff is the assessment tools and the interactive things that you put together. So would you mind talking us through what you developed and how you developed that? So we decided to do two things or two major approaches. One was multiple choice questions, which allowed us to put together the more traditional vignette style, board exam style questions, querying um, learners on you know four to five different answer choices. And these came right from the top for us. We have our program director, Dr. Krishnamurti, actually put these together for every organ system um, that is in the breakdown of the ABIM blueprint exam, like cardiovascular disease, pulmonary, all that kind of stuff. And through each of those multiple choice questions, we test the various learning points. The other arm of the self-assessment tools we made were more short answer type questions that through the literature stress uh, active recall and self-retrieval practices a lot more, uh, in a lot stronger fashion. So these questions, instead of being vignette style, are mostly first and second order questions uh, with shorter question stems um, that also give the learner immediate, they learn what the answer is right away. And over time, we're hoping to see that variations in use of the different assessment tools may or may not influence their performance on standardized exams like the ITE exam that we have every year um, and to see whether or not one of the two modalities is better. So that's just a potential query that we're questioning in our study. And similarly, GME programs can very simply put up a multiple choice or short answer quiz if they're interested in exploring these kind of modalities, just like we are. And I'm sure that they are. So how did you do that? How did you actually put the quizzes <laughs> on the website? Is, I guess sure. that was a great answer, um, but I'm a simple, simple man. So how did you put the quizzes together and actually get them onto the website? So again, we, we keep coming back to WordPress plugins. Um, so one that we one that we used for multiple choice questions is something called WordPress Pro Quiz. And effectively, you put your you put each question into each section on on the plugin. It's very intuitive. You have all your an individual answer choices. You tell the plugin which one is correct, and automatically after that, the plugin software itself you know will give the user a score and and will give it to them in their their individualized password. Paul, we need to use that in our show notes. Uh, that's a side note. <laughs> this is great. I'll make another note, Wada. Yeah. Tell us. Right. So tell so tell us about the uh, and then the short answer questions. What we're using for that? Yet another plugin. Uh, that's I guess the, the theme of this is the plugin episode. I, I guess. Um, uh, yet another plugin. Um, this one we use was something called Quiz Cards, and uh, another free uh, open source software where you can, similarly to the multiple choice questions, just put in a list of short answer questions. Uh, or quite frankly, you could put anything on these flashcards, to be honest with you. That's just what we decided to use. Um, but the the tool that we used for it was quiz cards with a Q. Uh, again, another free to use, um, fantastic resource with a lot of what's the word, tutorials and, and FAQs, and we, we were able to get that deployed in a day and a half of work, I'd say. This is quiz, Q-W-I-Z cards.com. Correct. All right. And then the the final part of this that also sounds intimidating to me is is that you made these interactive cases, which, how did, how which plugin did you use for that? I'm going to guess it was a plugin. So, so this I'll was actually... actually Go ahead, I'm going to go jump ahead. in on this one. This is my personal favorite part. Um, so this is not a plugin. This is something called Twine. Ah. Um, we, so this is the only thing we outsourced. Uh, Twinery.org. It's open source. It's an interactive story creator. Um, the original inception of this was to make games. Um, so if if everybody can think back to their favorite old um, choose your own adventure story, uh, turn to page 79 if you want to go in the cave. Uh, go to page 52 if you want to go in the forest. And so it was a very simple visual-based um, coding software that you would literally jump from box to box and it would make arrows. So you could have multiple branch points. And then if you wanted to go back to an earlier branch point, you could. And so the natural progression of this was to help our learners through high stakes clinical decision-making. So 
when our residents transition from PGY1 into PGY2, they become a part of the rapid response team. And there was a lot of angina every year over what am I going to do during my first rapid response? Am I going to make the right choice? And so this allows you to make very good and very bad decisions for your patient. Um, somebody who has atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, somebody uh, who has new onset uh, dyspnea after uh, a trip to the OR. Um, and so you could pull in um, choices to review the chart or look at lab data, or I want to give them a breathing treatment or diurese them and go back and forth through the scenario. And of course, all the scenarios coalesce either at a good, medium, or bad outcome with a final slide that explains how they did relative through their path. Um, as somebody who really emphasizes clinical reasoning skills and how you should think about the ways you approach your patient and your decision making, this was my favorite thing to play with. I loved it. I, you're nice enough to share some examples. I, I think one of the reasons I liked it is because I didn't kill the patient. <laughs> like I, I went through the <laughs> the AFib with RVR patient, um, and it was just yeah, it was really intuitive, and I like I found like the summary at the end really really helpful. So that was it's a really neat tool. Yeah, and 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 this has been one way where we were able to bring in a lot of other faculty because um, it, it was it was very easy for us to you know turn to a faculty or turn to an academic specialist and be like, hey, do you have a really cool case in mind that maybe we could break down and make into one of these interactive scenarios? Oh, that's a great um, idea. Yeah, so that so that was really exciting. So that that's kind of where you know our our code stroke, for example, our code stroke interactive scenario was was something that um, that uh, was experienced between one of our residents and and the stroke team and stuff like that. So is is this online environment uh, in itself is is a really cool way to bring in a lot of people that have not been involved with your teaching and, and with your learners to bring them in and, and get them involved. So. You guys have, have talked to us about a lot of the resources that you that you use to put together this this kind of remarkable curriculum. I guess the one resource that I, I want to talk about is is time and how how long it took you to put this stuff together initially, and then you know currently there's a thirst for online curricula during this pandemic because people are trying to figure out how to teach people not all in the same room at the same time or teach people remotely. So how how quickly can you put something like this together if you're if you're pressed for time? I'll speak to the Zoom conferences. We literally flipped in a day. We did not miss a single didactic. Um, it helped that we already had a microphone, getting the Zoom up and running and teaching people how to remote in. I would say that that takes maybe two to three hours worth of work. Um, getting the lectures broadcast and uploaded, again, minimal 15 minutes per, per lecture. That's not the time investment that folks need to worry about. It's intuitive and straightforward. Uh, yeah, and what what I would add to that is I, I think it would really it would really just depend on what your goal would be as you know if, as in a GME department as an IM program. Um, if we're talking about scaling or adjusting your didactics in a way to accommodate for this new environment of the pandemic, I would agree with 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 Kat in that it it may or may, it may very well just happen over a day uh, with with Zoom being such a powerful tool as it that it is already. But if we're talking about building something like this online tool and scaling it out, um, it's, it's definitely going to be a, a time commitment. Um, the way, or rather the, how we see our time commitments playing out are, are rather across uh, two, or in two ways rather. On the month level, we've decided to add something new to the website every single time. So for about a week uh, of each month, we're dedicating that time to building whatever the tool is or building a new portion of the content and putting it out onto the, the website. But prior to that, there'll have to be a chunk of time investment at the forefront to build a skeleton of whatever you want to build. And I think that's just going to depend on what your goals are and what your technical capacities are. Um, so as a final answer, I, I would just say to GME programs out there, definitely budget time along with costs, because especially on the front end, it's going to be something that you will have to invest if you really want this to be successful for you. You can make a pretty ugly WordPress uh, website in about a week. Um, it won't be nice. It won't be well laid out, but it'll be functional. You can put links in it. Um, you can direct learners to different data. Um, in terms of building out the interactive tools, uh, Amrit can churn out flashcards faster than anybody I've ever seen. Um, our twines usually take a good three to four days worth of effort once we've got a good idea of the narrative that we want to tell and the teaching points that we want the person to take home from that scenario. 
Uh, same for the zebra cases. Yeah, because I would imagine, I mean, it would probably, I think exactly as you say, sort of a short outlay to get the original website together and then maybe flip the lectures to videos that can be hosted. But I think to put together the stuff that you put together, the interactive component and sort of the longitudinality of it, um, I, yeah, I imagine it takes a good bit more time. Certainly, certainly. But after that initial time investment, we really saw our month-to-month time commitments constrained. So, Perfect. Okay. What about the, you mentioned this to us, uh, off air right now at this point, but the learner that is unengaged in your traditional lectures, how are you handling those people? Is there, have you found any workarounds for getting those people engaged in, for your online content? Uh, short of forcing everybody into the chats and requiring that if you're counted for attendance, you have to put one meaningful remark into the group discussion. <laughs> okay, that's that's something. <laughs> that's, that's the best workaround we've come up with so far for various levels of meaningful contributions. Well, these are adults. They, you know, you can't, can't win them all. Uh, Paul, <laughs> Paul just loves my, Paul loves my comments. Just the, the cash like motto. You, you can't win them all. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know I do, I do agree with that in this, in this setting though. So you've, you've given us a lot of fantastic information. I think this will be really useful. There's a real thirst for this. Um, before we wrap up, do you guys, we'll, we'll start with Kat and then finish with Tom Reed. If you guys would give us sort of one or two major take home points for, for this topic. I'll start. Um, so the website was um, a great uh, educational intervention. Um, but when we really saw it shine is when we had to very quickly cope with rapidly changing circumstances having a central website that residents knew to go to, they trusted, they could access routinely, that became our central clearinghouse of where data coalesced, given that our program directors and chiefs could be the only ones to update the website and disseminate information. It really helped us control, this is the accurate updated information, workflows, schedules that residents needed to pay attention to. So having this pre-existing for your program is disaster preparedness in one sense. Right. And to to stem with that, I think I think my take home point for all this would be just to really encourage GME programs out there to consider something like this uh, in this in this modern medical education environment. Uh, This type of online tool can offer a lot of benefit to your program, to your learners, and has a lot of possibilities to bring in new uh, and different and evidence-based modalities to your your educational environment. Um, So even if it's something simple, I think it would be something useful for your program in the long run. How can people reach both of you if they wanted to to get more information uh, about, about how to do all this? Uh, I'll go first then. Uh, so uh, folks can uh, reach me at uh, Bros Encephalon. That's B-R-O-S-E-N-C-E-P-H-A-L-O-N, like Bros Encephalon with a B, uh, on <laughs> all platforms. I'm mostly active on Twitter. And then, of course, brosencephalon.com is, uh, is a website that some of you may have heard. Um, and I just want to take this opportunity to really thank everybody for all their support over the years. Uh, and I'm really excited to take all my new experiences from residency and, and offer you guys more resources and ideas like today's episode. Excellent. And you can find me, um, my main place that you can find me is the website. It's intentional, um, as in to operate with intent, intentionalmeded.org, um, with my Twitter handle inked underscore caduceus, um, and yes, for anybody in the audience who's wondering, he is that Rosencephalon of the uh, Anki-based card review deck for undergraduate med ed. Of course, that's how he's pumping out the flashcards, like you said. <laughs> <laughs> in my sleep, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much to both of you. This was fantastic. Thank you to you guys. What an honor. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. All right. <laughs> it's been a couple shows without it. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. We're committed to providing you with high value, practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. Special thanks to Paul Williams for producing this episode 
and to our social media team, Hannah R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on Instagram, and Chris the Chew Manchu on Facebook. Until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And before we leave you, we'd of course like to thank the great Stuart Brigham for composing our theme music and the amazing Claire Morgan of not only for editing our sometimes chaotic audio. And as always, I remain Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.